180 letters volatilize into a forest of ocular organs. So thank you, Sheldon, for talking with me on In the Field here at the Outsound Presents channel. Of course, Brad. Thank you for, uh, uh, for all you've done for the community. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always been my pleasure to be able to present the summit and to present a wide array of improvisation and new music, and that's what you're coming to do this year at the 16th Annual Outsound New Music Summit. And um, I don't think I've ever uh, had a t chance to really talk with you, so this is a great opportunity to find out a little more in depth about um, your beginnings and the music that you're going to be presenting. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll start with the standard question on today is... Uh, was uh, alto saxophone your first instrument, or what was your first, and when did you start playing music? I uh, started playing when I was 10 in elementary school, like mm -hmm. a lot of people, and uh, started on alto because that was the size of saxophone that I could handle <laughs> at 10 years old. Uh, switched to tenor in junior high school. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And sort of have done tenor, alto, and soprano mm -hmm. as an adult. Have you, uh, did you come from a musical family? My dad was a drummer. He was a big jazz freak. He was okay. a Clifford Brown, Max Roach aficionado. Yeah. Had the little bebop fake books at home, which I started to learn out of when I was in you know, junior high. So you were you were exposed at an early age. I was exposed at a pretty early age. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what was it about jazz? Because you know, I, I, you're not much older than me. If, if maybe I'm older than you, I'm not sure. But I know that most of my peers were listening to like, you know, AC/DC and. And, and and Rolling Stone still at that time and so forth in, in in the rock scene. So what was it for? What was jazz for you? Because you know, well, it was something different. It was something. It sounds weird to say. It was kind of a counterculture, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, to be to to listen to music that your parents were into. It was sort of went against the grain of everyone else I was growing. It was like it was different. It was mm -hmm. removed. It was. Mm -hmm. you know, Right, and then you were in band, so you were with other other kids that were probably kind of going in that direction as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I was able to, you know, there were some really, uh, I've really been really thankful that there were people in the public schools up there who wanted to have jazz bands for junior high school kids mm -hmm. and high school kids. Right. I was able to, you know, Dick Stroud, junior high, Jacob's junior high school. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> and and where, where was this taking Eureka, place? Eureka, Eureka. Oh, up, up in Northern Eureka, California. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. And were there any particular favorite um, saxophonists or jazz musicians that were influencing you in those early years? Well, you know, uh, there was a, there was a bunch of stuff going on at the college level when I was up in, up up there. Um, you know, there were guys like uh, Michael Moore, the alto and clarinet alto sax player and clarinet player oh, yeah. composer. He was in the high, the college bands when I was in junior high school, so I was sort of looking up to him. And yeah. there was a whole generation of Thatcher, mm -hmm. uh, and there was this fantastic bebop tenor player named Barry Block, who unfortunately just passed away this oh. last spring, okay. who was one of my earliest favorite saxophone players. And so through him, uh, you know, he just channeled all that stuff from the 40s bebop stuff. I mean, he right. could play like it was 1945, or he could play like it was 1953, or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, he just had that command of his vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal bebop player. So you had a lot of live music experiences. That yeah, sounds like. yeah, and it's you know in hindsight you realize how amazing those opportunities were because you know, yeah. growing up like oh this is small town USA it's got all these fabulous jazz players hanging out right. playing composing great you know music and, and improvising at a, at a high level and then you go you, you know you get out of the bubble and you go out into the world and you look around and go no <laughs> it was just like this little pod of stuff that was there right yeah because yeah, you hear a lot a lot of our colleagues talk about who they were listening to on records right you know course, yeah, and, yeah. and and so but so this is uh, it's it's rare to hear that you have the uh, someone had an opportunity to hear so many live performers and that's f quite profound actually yeah i've been very grateful in some way yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah wonderful yeah. so then you you continued on obviously <laughs> playing um through, uh, you know, I'm assuming through college and so forth. Through college, you know, I didn't, I didn't finish college. I went, mm -hmm. you know, I moved down to the San Francisco Bay Area mm -hmm. uh, after one year of college mm -hmm. and just sort of hung out in the scene. And yeah, when, when was that? 79. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and who were you playing with in the early 80s? In the early 80s? There was a bunch of people who were doing, you know, 
original music bands. Um, my friend Doug Morton and I had a band called Rivals that played original music. And it was this funky little band. Uh, and uh, Clark Soprinowitz, Michael Smolens, mm -hmm. a couple of guys who were doing original music bands. And mm -hmm. That just sort of was my favorite thing to do, was like go work on somebody's original music. Yeah. And I was writing stuff, you know, getting some stuff played by little groups, but I didn't really have a regular group of mine until the late 80s mm -hmm. or even early 90s. Right, so you, you were composing all this time. I was time composing all the time, you know. Here. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. knocking stuff out. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, particular influence on your compositional uh, style or That's some form, you know, direction that you've been going it's in? Hard to, it's hard to say, you know, because... You know, I'd say when I was, uh, you know, in my early 20s, my biggest influences were, you know, it was pretty diverse. I mean, I loved Anthony Braxton and all that stuff that was coming out of Chicago mm -hmm. and Art Ensemble of Chicago and all the other groups. Um, and I was really into that group, Oregon. Oh, yeah. That was a really big influence on me because the, the way they, they, you know, they, because they would improvise quite a bit too. I mean, they would just do completely free imp improv mm -hmm. and they would do very structured tunes and, and compositions. And uh, there was uh, something about them that had a, a pretty big influence on me. But, you know, mm -hmm. on, you know, there was all that stuff coming out on ECM in the early oh, sure. 80s. You right. know, that had yeah. a big influence on me. I'll John Christensen and right. John Kabarak and all those guys. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Julius Hempel, Dogon AD, oh, <laughs> Arthur yeah. Blythe, Bush Baby. Of course. That was one of my favorite al albums. Mm -hmm. back. It was just so elemental. You know, it was just really amazing. Yeah. So there was, there was all favorite. this stuff. It's like, how do you integrate interests in improvisation mm -hmm. and composition and all these different stylistic bags? So I just was absorbing all this stuff and just like writing little pieces with, that followed up various little leaves of those influences. But you were, when you were here, when you came down here, you were playing jazz, right? right. And there, there must have been a moment because cause we're talking and you know a lot of the folks that I know and there's like this cross section, right? So at some point you must have run into some of the, I don't know what you want to call them, Non-idiomatic experimental musicians, improvisers, oh, and yeah, so yeah, yeah. that, you know, and that into so when when was that? Do you know? Or? It was always yeah. continuous. It was oh, continuous, really? uh, you know, because Philip Greenleaf and I right. have been buddies since Eureka. Philip oh. was up was going to College of the Redwoods up there. Oh, okay. And we met up there, and then independent, you know, of each other at different times, we both moved to the Bay Area, mm -hmm. and I wound up running into him in a coffee shop. Mm. And then we were in a band together. Mm -hmm. uh, and he straddles that fence. And too. he straddles that fence. Yeah. And, and you know, we, right. you know, like we used to go down to the Powell Street Bart Station at like ten o'clock at night or eleven o'clock at night. And you know that there's that little enclosed space as you're walking out. We used to go in there because we liked the sound. And we used to just do free improv, just totally <laughs> free improv. And some guy walked through one night who ran a place called Lay Disc on Haight Street, and he hired us wow. to play, what, to do what we were doing down there in the Powell Street Bar Station in, in the club. So I, that was like in the early 80s, and it was like a completely improv. That's great. You know, a saxophone duo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was always there. I mean, and I'm trying to think who else I was in contact with doing that kind of music. I know Metalang, the, the label, Metalang, which was like, Henry Kaiser oh, and Tim right. Perkis and you know those guys they they were doing a lot of recording putting out records doing festivals I actually have a metal leg festival record from 1982 I believe wow yeah so they were there at the same time right did you run into any of those guys no or? yeah no yeah I was pretty evil or like Roba I remember when those guys came out, yeah. I remember seeing them at the Great American Music Hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I didn't get to know of any of those guys for until years later. Until later, right? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Buzz with those guys. Right. All those guys. 
So, speaking of that, uh, in terms of the many different styles and the elements that you, know, you, you have grown up with and, and lived with for so long, this, this project you're bringing to the right. summit this year right. is uh, definitely on that vast array and outer edge of com combining all those elements, because at least what I've heard so yeah. far. Yeah. So, can you tell, tell me a little bit more about Blood of the Air and what that's all about? Blood of the Air is um, sort of a, the culmination of a project that I started about seven years ago called Distant Intervals. And you, you oh, yes. presented the very first <laughs> show of that. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Um, of that group. And you know, it was, I was sort of, I had met Andrew Joron, the poet, and uh, gotten interested in specifically surrealist poetry. And it was sort of like, you know, just intrigued by the idea of using speech melodies and, and in the context of surrealist poetry because mm -hmm. of the felt invited to be as free as I wanted to be mm -hmm. in the context of the surrealist poetry. And and what surrealist poetry are you are you uh, drawing from? Well, let's see. Okay, so a Andy Andrew John yeah. wrote a, a, a long essay about the influence of surrealism in, in contemporary American poetry, mm -hmm. and uh, I just sort of went through that book and I like he just talks about all these different poets oh, okay. Philip Lamantia was sort of the, right. the main guy uh -huh. and then there was just you know lots and lots of others who were active during the 60s 70s 80s okay who were if not officially sanctioned by the surrealist movement <laughs> is, is there they such were, a thing <laughs> well no after well I don't know <laughs> you're talking I'm going to get in trouble here I don't know uh, I mean that's a new, that's um, a new, new term I, I didn't know that there was I, an official I I sanction just, I don't I'm being overly <laughs> dramatic. Um, yeah. uh, he, uh, but it was probably, you know, uh, Ivan Arguelles, who's a, a, you know, a local figure mm -hmm. um, who's still quite active, pumping lots of stuff out, um, is another figure. And he lives the, here? He lives here in the Bay Area, oh. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. and he's fan he does fantastic work. And so one of, the, one of the early pieces we did in Distant Intervals was one of his pieces. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, but Philip Lamont, and I did one Philip Lamontia piece just for that group, you know, several years ago, mm -hmm. many years ago. And, uh, so I got an idea to do a project based on just exclusively Lamontia's work, mm -hmm. uh, partly because Andy was one of the editors on the Lamontia Collective, it was published by UC Press. Oh yeah, I think I was at that that, that release show at Burton Beckett. Wasn't there a right? Book there release? was a group. Uh, Ouroboros is a uh, is this book is this group of uh, poets and one non poet. Right. Uh, uh, Clark Coolidge, mm -hmm. Andrew Joron, and Joseph Noble. Right. And, right. Uh, okay. Yeah. We we per we played at the uh, at the opening. Uh, I mean the release of that. Yeah. That and uh, so I thought, you know, since I had never written any grant proposals before mm -hmm. and the book was going to be coming out that fall, that I would aim a you know, project towards that release. And, yeah. You know, since this was a thing that was sort of already in motion, right? you know, I just thought I'd, I'd and, you know, I didn't really, really think it through all that much. I said, oh, it'd be great you know, to do this and I you know, didn't, didn't think I would get it. But so and I got it. Are these melodies you said you mentioned a word, uh, speech? Speech melodies. Melodies. So, is that is that a specific term within the the realm of surrealist poetry, or is that something you've created? No, that means what we're what we're doing right now. Da 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 da. Oh, okay. Every time oh, you, I see. Every time you speak, you, know, you make a melody. Okay. There's a rhythm and a pitch element. Right. So I just took the pitch and rhythm elements and from recordings. From recordings of Lamantia uh -huh. reading his work. I see. And. Um, and then are you guys reading his works as well? No. We're, we've got, we're, we use the recordings. Oh, okay. And we play along with the recordings a, a bit. Like I'll, I'll play a passage of, you know, with, with the recording of La Mantilla. Mm -hmm. And then we'll shut the recording off and then we'll take those ideas and oh. I, I develop them compositionally on, and I, you know, right. we use them in, in, in improv Oh, as I well. see. Yeah. Okay. Right, so you're channeling Lamantia directly, 
while the performance is happening. Is that what I'm? I possible? guess you could say that, and especially Lauren. You know, because Lauren is taking oh, yes. these melodies. Lauren Benedict, right? Lauren Benedict, and he's he's uh, applying his his own verbiage. Yeah. To them, which I that's one of my favorite things in the group is actually just like hearing somebody else's speech melody with their own <laughs> their own words their own language words yeah yes words. I use that term advisedly yeah he has a lexicon yeah that uh, I have this it's truly a truly original thing yeah I always think of it as serbo Martian it's amazing and that you've been able to uh, incorporate that as well because I always thought about ways to do that with Lauren's work. Oh. You know, and uh, I think it's a wonderful thing that we're, now I get to actually experience that. Yeah, yeah. With him working within the context of poetry and composition and, and, yeah. and yeah. experimental music, so to speak. Because I, I would put that in that category, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. He's one of a kind. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> So, and then you had, so and this is a large ensemble. It's a 10 piece group. Yeah. Yeah. Got right. Darren, Darren Johnson on trumpet, mm -hmm. and Dave McNabb and John Sinkliner on guitars. Right. Andrew Drummond on theremin. Right. Dan Zimmelman on piano. And two on, drummers? Two drummers. Yeah. Uh, um, BJ Anderson and yeah. Alan Hall. Oh, yeah. And Michael Wilcox on bass. Oh, great. Yeah. Wow. That should be quite amazing with yeah, the sound. Yeah, Filling up the room and all that. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, have you released recording of this project? No. Uh, we did. We finished a record, a studio recording. Hmm. It just I just had it mastered this year. Okay. Uh, we did some of the recording in 2015 and a little bit last yeah. fall. Okay. And uh, yeah, we're look, sort of looking around for. I'm either going to put it out myself or find sure. some label who. Yeah, yeah. Somebody who might be interested in putting it out? Right. Yeah, yeah I hear you. Yeah, yeah, it's uh it's always a question. Yeah, <laughs> you have to ask yourself. So, um, and are you are you working on uh, future projects within this realm or in another like other thematics or? I've got this um, this project that's sort of been I've been working on off and on for the last several years. God. Uh, uh, Exploring the quarter tone vocabulary. Really? With alto sax, and I have a, actually a quarter tone guitar. Hmm. And um, I get really deep into that and then get pulled away to do other stuff. Sure. As you know, yeah. there's so many things to yeah. keep, keep track of. <laughs> of course. But that, you know, that's, that's something that I, I felt like. Um, like to follow through on, mm -hmm. and uh, then my own, just like my regular ongoing group playing my non-poetry mm -hmm. related original music mm -hmm. has sort of been off to the side a little bit, so mm -hmm. I hope to bring that back into the Yeah, you've been working with Ben Goldberg, too. Yeah, yeah, I've worked with Ben Goldberg in, in lots of different contexts. Um, we had a group with uh, Kenny Wallace and Richard Saunders, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes... Uh, uh, Bill Douglas, right, and uh, and we've of course been doing clarinet thing ah. for many years. Oh right, and uh, yeah. more recently we've been doing a, we did a quartet with uh, Jason Lewis and John Shiflett. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, just lost John. Just a tragedy, but um, we're doing music of. Herbie Nichols and Thelonious Monk. Great. And we did a we did a show uh, last December, last November where we did uh, music from the album Love Gloom Cash Love for uh, <laughs> three horns, piano, bass, drums. Wow, rude. Nice. Great. Well, it sounds like you're keeping busy, and uh, we're so glad that you're going to be able to bring this project live to the summit this year. Well, I'm, it's a really it's a pleasure. It's an honor to be involved with the Great. Outside well. Center. So that you'll be playing on July 27th That's right. at the Community Music Center. So hopefully folks will come out and check it out. So thank you so much. Thanks, Appreciate it, Sheldon. Okay. Green corn makes a white butterfly into an obelisk traveling by night. Its magnetic leaves of orist fingers. What's written on the obelisk's petticoat?